Okay. Uh, our next speaker is Erin Lennis. Uh, she's currently the, a graduate student at Arizona State University. So this morning she'll be telling us about covering perfect hash families and covering the arrays. Let's welcome her. I am one of uh, Professor Colburn's graduate students, uh, so I am very excited to get to be here and present some of our joint work. Um, also, some of the uh, slides will include work with Cashew Star Card. So, without saying anything else, let me get started. So, in this talk, I'm going to briefly uh, cover a known construction for covering arrays that uses covering perfect hash families and permutation vectors. Um, I will also talk about a conditional expectation algorithm that we developed to work to work with um, the search for carbon perfect cash families. I will explore some of the recursive approaches that we've worked on that include composition and affine transformations in order to build larger carbon perfect cash families from smaller ingredients. And I will briefly, hopefully, get to talk on um, some other uses of using ingredient carbon perfect cash families that are found by either conditional expectation or composition. Uh, so, as a very quick reminder from the last talk, a covering array of strength T is an n by k array on these symbols where every interaction appears at least once. And an interaction is a t-tuple of column symbol pairs. There are many applications of covering arrays. One of the most common is to develop test suites to identify factor interactions. And in these cases, uh, again, the, the columns are the factors, the rows are the tests, every test incurs some cost, and so we would like to minimize the number of tests that we have to run, so we want to minimize the number of rows. Construction for covering arrays can be difficult. Um, there are two main camps for constructions, mathematical approaches and um, computational approaches. The mathematical approaches often um, can produce arrays with fewer rows, but they often only work for certain parameter values because of the underlying algebra. Uh, conversely, computational approaches often produce suboptimal arrays that have more rows than are needed, um, but they work for a variety of parameter values, so we can use them in the general case. They also are sometimes um, inefficient, and so one option is to try to combine mathematical approaches with computational approaches to try to get some benefit from both of them. So in order to get to our covering perfect cash families, we first have to understand what permutation vectors are. So if we let um, B0, B1, up to Bt minus 1 be a base B representation of a symbol from the set from 0 to B to the T minus 1, then a permutation vector is the B to the T length vector that has symbol B0 times H0 plus B1 times H1, etc. in position I for each of the symbols in, in the set that we're talking about with arithmetic over the field. One very useful subspace restriction fixes H0, the first coordinate in the permutation vector, to always be 1. And in that case, we don't have to give H0, and we can just um, give H1 through HT minus 1. Throughout the rest of the talk, this is the restriction that I'm referring to, and so I will denote permutation vectors this way. So as an example, how do we compute um, this column? So on the left here, we have um, i. And again, i is going to run from uh, 0 up to v to the t minus 1. This is the base v representation for i. And then I'm trying to compute this permutation vector that is, again, in that uh, subspace restriction. I've got v is 3 and t is 3. So I'm going to take B0, I'm going to add uh, B1 times H1, and then add B2 times H2, and that's going to be the value 0. And so if I do that for each of the values i, I'm going to end up with this B to the T length column. So a set of T of these permutation vectors listed here is going to be covering, if and only if the system of, of uh, T linear equations given here with these unknowns does not have a non-zero solution. So another way to say that is that they're covering if the v to the t, t tuples appear exactly once. This is something that we really want covering arrays, right? 
and it's non-covering if any t tuple appears more than once, right? If e to the t one, if any t tuple appears more than once, then there's some that we're missing. Uh, a covering t set is a way of saying the t symbols that represent the set of covering permutation vectors. So instead of having to think about that whole column, we can just think about these t symbols. So a Sherwood covering perfect hash family is an n by k array on e to the t minus one symbols for which every n by t subarray contains a covering t set in at least one row. They are a restriction of more general covering perfect hash families, again, the subspace rest restriction. This restriction um, gives us the property that the first v positions of every vector only depends on v0, and therefore the first v uh, positions of every vector are a constant row, a constant tuple of the same values, and they're all the same for every vector. So here's an example. On the left is a Sherwood covering perfect hash family that has two rows, five columns, nine symbols, and it has strength three. Here I have put in red um, the only T set that is non covering for row one. So if we look to the right, these are the columns that correspond to those permutation vectors. And we can see here that the tuple 000, zero, zero appears three times. So something else doesn't appear, so this uh, t-set is non-covering. And because it's non-covering, we have to cover it in another row. So in row two, we have covered that um, set of three columns with a covering t-set. And I didn't put uh, all 27 values here for you to check, but if we notice here is the 000, zero, zero and then here we have 0, zero 001. And if we look further on, we have 0, 0, 2, and we need to verify that it is covering. Because the first V rows are all the same for every permutation vector, then every, um, every row of the covering array would have the same tuples repeated over and over and over again. And so we can remove those first V rows and have a shortened permutation vector that has length V to T minus V. And so this gives us our covering array construction from the Sherwood covering perfect hash families. So what we're doing here is we're taking uh, this Sherwood covering perfect hash family, and for each row, we are replacing it with this uh, with a shortened permutation vector. And then we're going to add the v constant values again at the end to create our covering array. So we're doing column replacement to get from a smaller. Um, covering perfect hash family to the bigger covering array that we need. This works when V is a prime power because of the way permutation vectors work. So that's the disadvantage. The advantage, however, is that they provide a very compact representation for covering arrays. So instead of searching for these really good covering arrays, we can search for smaller covering perfect hash families. So then that asks the question, how do you find covering perfect hash families? Uh, we developed a greedy one row at a time approach that's based on the following um, observations. So once we know T and V, we can compute the number of non-covering T sets. That means that we can compute the probability of selecting a covering T set if the symbols are chosen at random. That means that we can compute the expected number of previously uncovered T sets that are covered for the first time by a row if the row is chosen at random. Uh, we can talk about a partial row as being a row in which some columns are fixed and some columns are free. That means that some columns have symbols already assigned and some columns have symbols that are not yet assigned, they are unassigned. There is always a selection um, for a symbol in a partial row if I'm looking at a particular column that does not reduce the expectation. So given that column that I want to fix, I can consistently select a symbol that meets or exceeds the expectation. Uh, this is a really nice property that the when, when we're trying to meet or exceed the expectation to fix a, col a symbol in a particular column, I only need to consider the remaining neighborhood of that column. In other words, I only need to consider the other columns that are involved in um, T subsets that are not yet covered. So it's a small um, number of the columns in the main array. I don't have to look at the whole row at once. So uh, this is an outline of the algorithm that we developed. So if we take all of the patients T, T subsets of the columns and add them to some list, while there is some, uh, while that list is not empty, while, um, 
there is some key subset that has not yet been covered. We're going to create a new row that has all of the columns free. Then we're going to consider each of the columns in the set of columns. If RI is the partially fixed remaining neighborhood of CI, so again, that's the uh, columns that are involved in the uncovered T subset along with CI. We can look at each of the symbols in the set of symbols, and we can compute the expectation for the neighborhood if we were to fix that symbol, uh, that column to that particular symbol. So finally, we can choose the symbol for that column that maximizes the expectation for that remaining neighborhood. Then once we do that, we can look and see um, what have we now covered, and then repeat until we've covered everything. You can imagine that when uh, V and T are large, that's a lot of symbols, and this can run for weeks. So we might not be interested in letting this run for weeks. We might need something that's pretty good right now. And so we can allow ourselves to exit if uh, the symbol that we're considering covers some fixed threshold that we're interested in. Particularly, we could be interested in meeting the expectation, and so we could set that value. Um, at the time, that this was run, these were covering arrays with the fewest number of rows that were known. So in other words, this works pretty well. And we can produce um, intermediate size, so intermediate number of factors, covering arrays from this method. It also will work for any strength. There was an additional algorithm uh, that was developed to replace one column. So in a replace one column, we take a candidate covering perfect cash family, and if it doesn't meet the properties that we need, something is uncovered, we can resample one of the col one of the columns in one of the uncovered um, T subsets. We can also use random extension. So random extension says I have a covering perfect cash family. I can randomly produce columns to see if I added that column to the end, would I still have a covering perfect cash family? And then we can continue to do that until we basically run out of time or we meet some, some threshold where we say, I've tried too many times and it doesn't seem to be working, so that must be, that must be the amount of improvement I can get. So this replace one column with random extension improved on um, many of the known results. Conditional expectation alone was quite competitive with replace one column, but even better, when we combine conditional expectation with random extension, so we're going to build a covering perfect cash family by conditional expectation, and then we're going to try to add a column or columns, um, it improved on the uh, replacement column. And so what you're looking at here is for strength three, along this side are the number of symbols, so from three to 25. And from here, we're looking at about zero columns to 10,000 columns. So everywhere that you see one of these thick black lines is where um, Conditional expectation with random extension provided an improvement over replacement column. Okay. So we can also compose um, smaller ingredients into larger Sherwood covering perfect hash families. So if I have a covering perfect hash family, I can make m copies of the ingredient array. If all column indices are distinct in a T subset, it is necessary and sufficient um, that those are covered in the composed array. We know exactly how many T subsets remain to be covered and we know exactly where they are. So anytime I have the same, let's call this a column index, let's call these like uh, subarray indices, anytime I have the same column index is going to be non-covering. So those are things that I need to cover by running conditional expectation again to get some vertical growth and get to a new covering for cash family. Uh, these are some results by taking the smaller covering for cash families and composing in the larger ones. So we can make, um, we take one with 1,000 columns, we can get one with 5,000 columns. Um, one problem is that these copies result in column duplication. Everywhere um, that I had this column here, I would have had this column here. It leaves many T subsets left to cover. Interestingly, the classes of non-covering and covering T sets are closed under arithmetic in the field. So we can apply affine transformations to the ingredients to get these transformed sugar covering perfect cash families. And each one is still a covering perfect cash family, which is fantastic. And we can make, given one ingredient, V times V minus one to the N times T minus one. So we can do a lot of, we can reduce a lot of um, duplication by applying a affine composition. So in practice, 
this, the improvement is huge. So here, this would be the number of T subsets remaining using simple copies. And when we apply the affine transformations for affine composition, we end up with only 2% of the remaining T subsets. So it's not always true, but in general, fewer T subsets remaining means we need fewer rows because we have, we have a fewer number of things to cover by that vertical growth. Uh, we can also do multiple compositions. So here, um, let's see, I have, I started with an ingredient with 40 columns. I made five copies, and then that had 200 columns. I made five copies again, so I'd end up with 1,000 columns. Um, versus this is a direct uh, greedy conditional expectation. I just made 1,000 columns, and I found the covering perfect definitely. Um, oh, sorry, covering array. I'm talking about covering arrays now. So in this case, along the left axis, we have the running time, and that's the blue bars. And on the right side, we have the number of rows in the resulting covering array. So if I do it directly, it's going to take 1,394 seconds, and I'm going to end up with 965 rows. Versus if I make five copies of an ingredient with 200, and this is just using the regular composition simple copies, it's only going to take 38 seconds, and I ended up with the same number of rows. So that's pretty fantastic, right? So in conclusion, um, Conditional expectation is a greedy algorithm that finds new and useful, sure recovering perfect cash families. We can use composition to create larger arrays more quickly than direct search. We can also apply affine transformations to reduce the duplication, which gives us better results in practice. And um, we have some work that we can do in the future looking at these various composition strategies, trying to figure out which ones work best. Um, and I won't get into this, but there is another paper that hopefully to look for where um, composition allows us to respect some structure that can help us restrict uh, the, 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 the search space, basically. OK, that's it. Is there any question for Harry? That app on uh, transformation, that's really nice. Like, percent, just from doing, like, isomorphism. Yeah. Um, and I will also say that this was um, this was pretty early, um, and this was before. In other words, this is using only a very small number of the affine transformations that we could do at the time. Um, so something that I skipped over that maybe I have a second to say. Um, when that number was computed, I was using the same. I believe it was the same adder and multiplier. Um, for all of the positions in the permutation vector, whereas we know we can actually use a separate adder and multiplier for each. So we can probably, in other words, we can probably do better. Do you think that you could take as your events the multipliers and adders and do a low bash local lemma on that <coughs> sample space? Let's talk about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's kind of cloudy in my head, but and I just have one last quick question. These run, when, you, when you say the number of seconds, um, are you implementing in C? This is done in um, C++. Okay, yeah. So it's compiled. Are you doing parallelism at all? Okay. And how many cores? I mean, how fast is the pro process? So some of these results, those ones are from, I think, 2015. Um, and I think I had a dual core okay. MacBook Pro. Okay. Was what that was run on. Okay. So yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Now let's thank the speaker again.